For those of you who'd like access to this content, follow the link in the description box, visit our Patreon page, and subscribe to the Black Kluge tier. For a mere $5 a month, you get access to the alternate Sunday episodes you've been missing, only available on Patreon, as well as the weekly Tuesday episodes. But wait, there's more. If you subscribe to the Black Kluge tier, you'll also get two weeks advance notice to our Thursday sessions. And if you needed any more incentive, when we have bonus episodes, Patreon is the place where you're going to find them. Also, don't forget to check out TeePublic for our great swag. The link is also in the aforementioned description. Honestly, I just thought you'd think it was kind of like funny. This chick's real into you. And then like, hey, if you're really into her, I, you know what? I swear to you, I like a stack of Bibles on my children's My life. point is, That I was my thought. Okay. All right. Well, listen, I believe you. Uh, that, but I, I, I don't, Not I, to embarrass I know, you. I know you believe in the Bible, and that, right. that means a lot. No, I said my children's <laughs> lives. <laughs> okay, so what was I going to tell you? Oh, yeah, I got a check in the mail yesterday for a dollar, six cents. The check caused more to write. I know. What was it for? It was for, remember a hundred years ago, I was on the Larry Sanders show? Yeah. The name of the episode was New York or L.A. And I did like a little walk on. So I got a residual check for a dollar six and I'm looking at it and I go, you know what? I signed the back of it. I'm going to cash it because you have to. Hang on. I have box office drawer. Why are they not contacting me to do more film? You got a name. I you got could a name, do and, another... I, and I put seats and I put people in the seat. You could do another movie. Why really? was I not tapped for the new Batman to play Scarecrow? Scarecrow. <laughs> oh, Look not at Batman. Yeah, why not? It's, I think you know, your problem is you're too picky. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I have You've it been offered some... a lot of roles, and you always find a reason to say no. Well, one, they had you're... me chasing a dog. A dog was chasing me for an entire weekend, and I locked myself in a in a safe, and I can't get out. That was the whole movie. <laughs> wow. And I turned it down. I I have, but uh... they didn't even offer you Scarecrow this time around, huh? No. They didn't offer it to me last time around. <laughs> sure. No, Howard Howard has <laughs> totally stopped touching yes. chips. That there was definitely a sit down there. <laughs> but I think it's a germ thing. What do you think the Australians and the Italians had a sit down? I'm just saying. <laughs> I think it's a germ thing with Howard, too. Don't, yeah. Where was the germphobia for 15 years? Exactly. There was germs yeah, germ nowhere. Yeah, right. <laughs> germphobia. It's like fucking. He I think he fingered Kendra Jade. He touched, he touched Houston tits on a regular basis. No <laughs> germphobia. It's a plague, and it affected you in a way that when you met John, you probably felt like, in a way, you were each kind of. Between the music, the musical mm -hmm. connection, and both losing your mothers, John was almost like your mother and you were his mother. In, in a way, you've kind of filled a hole for each other. Welcome, ladies and gents, to QF, a podcast about Howard Stern. I'm your host, Phil Moore, a.k.a. Jim Fix. With me, after, this is the first uh, show after Christmas, is Miss Sam. How are you, my dear? So great. How's everybody broke? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> waiting for the end, waiting for the credit card bill at the end of the month to come in. It's it's so I don't do I don't do credit cards, but I do think it's funny that when you're a kid, it's like, Christmas is the best thing ever. And then when you're an adult, it's the most expensive time of the year. <laughs> it's the worst. And I was so del I hate it actually because of, you know, more personal things that happened in some last three years. I just hate the, the, the time of year. So I can't wait for it to pass. And even though I like giving for giving to people and giving stuff, it just, I just want it to be over as quick as possible because for a number of reasons, but I hope that doesn't mean you guys can't have your own great times and dinner and all the, the fun stuff that does come with Christmas candy canes. I I miss candy canes. You don't get candy canes? No, nah, you can you can get them, but they're like they're weird flavored. I just want like the plain mint, like the mint old style ones. And you could like you suck on them for a while, then they become weapons. You can sharpen the tip. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> for know? sure. Dangerous. Yeah, they're that's very crazy. Dangerous. I didn't they're think like that Emmys. that's like an item you can't get. <laughs> that's yeah, so well, strange. No, you, know, no, you could you couldn't for a long time. You then you could get a, a variety, but they were sweet, like super sweet, like sugary. Mm -hmm. And that's not what I like the well the traditional ones, the old McCormick um, in Canada. That was the company that distributed them, and then the mini ones. Those I could demolish mm -hmm. those mini ones all day long. Me <laughs> the too. Source. The dentist is going. That's my boy. Oh yeah. 
Anyway, guys, uh, we're going to go with uh, this one. This was back from 2000, May 2010. Uh, Beth has released Oh My Dog. And this is going to be a oh. two-parter for sure because we've got a couple clips involved, including the uh, Letterman promo that we're going to play. Um, but the first one is um, – this is uh, – she'd gone in studio and she did an interview and we are not going through that just yet. But I wanted to play the wrap-up show segments and then Howard's reaction to the wrap-up show callers because yeah. she, she 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 was the guest that day in the studio and she plugged that fucking book. And do you remember it at the time? Oh, I remember exactly. Just – first of all, the insanity – it's like they thought we forgot how the relationship – started and how she was pushing for getting a pet. And then mm -hmm. at first it was wanting a cat and then it started with the dog and then they got the dog. And then all of a sudden she got labeled and branded a pet expert, like a dog expert for some reason, even though she only had one childhood dog as if mm -hmm. it was the, it was just, bizarre the way they treated her after the fact this book came out and we're supposed to look at her as some sort of amazing animal expert well here's the here's the deal um i i the first the people, a lot of people say the gift descriptions was the thing that, you know, that was the jump the shark moment. I don't think so. That's just normal. The show has always been about plug bullshit. Um, but that was a cringy moment because it was clear if she isn't his, his beard, then she doesn't, nobody gets on for that. Something like that. Well, it was just the gift description thing to me. It was just a badly hidden plug. The way that mm -hmm. they used to plug was less obvious and intrusive in my mm -hmm. opinion. So yeah. you understood what was happening, but it just seemed to go with the flow of the show. Whereas Beth's gift description thing, it was like a sudden halt and you were mm -hmm. just listening to this plug and what the hell? Why is this being rammed down our throat? Yeah. But then the pet thing came up and it just became a whole campaign. Yeah. And it was it was too much. And, it, you know, when whenever he would crowbar Beth into the show it was always a mistake because she's not likable. She's not funny. She's not talented. She's the, the direct opposite. She's not talented. She's incredibly unfunny and really, really annoying. And that whiny voice of hers. I mean, people give you shit about your voice. Nothing like Beth's that sing songy. I, I fucking I, could, I don't know that it's a not I don't even think it's a Pittsburgh thing. I think it was just a airheaded bimbo shithead thing. It's not as, I mean, the tone, you can't help, but it's what came out of her mouth that was just mm -hmm. unfunny, took herself so seriously, and the way she treated her supposed underlings immediately. There was a hierarchy where Beth was just untouchable, whereas Allison, it was equal ground there. You could toss shit to her. You could, she would toss it back. You know what I'm saying? And give it back. Like if she knew yeah. she was getting some shit. And I know some people say, were saying they missed the blind. So I'm going to bring a couple back, even though that was typically something I did with Raven. Um, these are all uh, mostly anti blinds. This one was from November uh, 08. I like this one. The advanced sales from this book are uh, from the permanent A list legend are not good. She waited too long and there are no buyers for the book. Barbara Streisand, my name is Barbara. It's totally true. Like, does anybody really care to read her book? I certainly never did. No. And she made the mistake of devolving, like most of these elitists, into Trump derangement syndrome, where that was selling maybe in 2018, 2019, but not now. No, everybody's tired. Well, you mean just people bitching about Trump? <laughs> yeah. It's just yeah. like, okay, we got it. The first well, 10 years. When, when he was president, it made sense. But when he's no right. longer president, not so much. No. No. Okay. So this next one is from uh, December 3rd. Mr. X, uh, what, uh, what, what illiterate, illiterate former talk show host is still in rehab, but not in the U.S. She's allegedly at a rehab in Switzerland of all places. This facility has been, has been used by one of her family members in the past. It's also a lockdown rehab. No phones, no iPads, nothing. She's been getting treated with an abuse to combat, uh, to combat her severe alcoholism. When she leaves, the facility is not clear, but I've heard it's going to be early next year. She's also fired her shady manager, 
and PR people on the advice of some very close friends, which she did before entering rehab. Wendy Williams. Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that, actually. Well, she was being enabled clearly by the people around her. And I think we've seen that a, a million times in other celebs' lives, like B Britney Spears. I mean, Christ, Christ you could yeah. do a whole other po podcast on that. Uh, and you do on your uh, Instagram, is it, or TikTok yeah. that you do? The I do I do a little bit of digging in the TikTok because I care about that a lot. But the Wendy Williams ones, I mean, everything from the, you know, awfulness of her private life and her husband taking yeah. advantage of her yep. to the showrunners to, you know, she was everybody's paycheck. So they just kept pushing it along, pushing it along. Meanwhile, everything was falling apart. And then of course, when things fall apart, everybody leaves to their own corners. Then who comes in? The people who are going to take, take charge of the vulnerability. And that's what happened. Yeah. Uh, this next one is I, – anyway, I'm, I'm rooting for her. I actually like Wendy Williams. I hope she does start that podcast she said she was going to do. And uh, – well, she didn't say it, but there, the, the scuttlebutt in the blinds was that it's going to happen. Or if she gets another show, and hopefully she stays on the, on the, on the wagon for it. Me, I know. I agree with you. I think that I posted a clip of – it was Andrew Schultz and a couple of other podcasters speaking about who's the goat of radio of all time. And they were arguing Charlemagne or Howard and Wendy Williams got brought up into the conversation and they said, you know, she's nowhere near as big as Charlemagne. And I understand what they're saying, but that's because she got, first of all, sidelined because the puff daddy stuff got kicked off a of hot 97 because he forced her out of her job. Yeah. That happened in the nineties. And then she, reinvented herself and developed a daytime talk mm -hmm. show as a minority, which is unheard of and was super successful. Yeah. And I, th I think the other thing was that show went for so long. I think they, they almost forgot that she had anything to do with radio. Right. Which does that make you not a goat? I think that still makes you a goat. Like you, you, be, you were able to leverage a bad situation where you were being basically ostracized out of radio because of Puff Daddy and Bad Boy, and you were able to make it on daytime TV and make it a huge success. I think that's better than Howard. Yeah. This uh, this one is from 1211. Uh, didn't this for former Friday night family lineup actor tell the world he is sober? He sure wasn't at a recent event. John Stamos. <laughs> <gasps> You sent me those clips and then I decided oh, to man. go on a I decided to go Deep on dive. a hunt for them. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. my god. This goes back further than I realized. It wasn't just the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory red carpet Fillmore. He did right when Bob Saget died, a Netflix special with a bunch uh -huh. of comedians, and he's twitching. He oh. is not paying attention. He's looking around everywhere. He looks tweaked the fuck out. Yes, it's definitely Coke, and it's if it ain't booze, it's Coke most of the time. And then the, obviously the booze to cut off, cut down the edge to you know take the edge off. But he's definitely still abusing substances, whatever. And he didn't he write that write a book basically talking about being sober. Yes, that was his yeah. whole gimmick, and he keeps in <laughs> interviews talking about being sober, even when he doesn't look sober in the interview or podcast. I recently watched one a few months ago with I oh. forgot the name of it, and. He looks completely fucked up. And I just keep thinking of his poor little kid. And where his he's, wife. He's giving these lines about sobriety and why he's doing it and watching him interact with his child like, like it's a puppet or a stuffed animal or something, petting it. It's so weird. Well, this the, uh, this one here, um, I, this I know this one is it goes into the uh, into the uh, the gutter. But uh, twelve nineteen, the wealthy farmer and a high ranking royal in a very cold country are about to have their holidays come crashing down because of what is going to be released to the public about their exploits with the dead billionaire, Bill Gates, met Marit, Crown Prince of Norway, Jeffrey Epstein. So um, when they oh, say yeah. farmer, they're talking about Bill Gates with the. Um, what was it? He's farming. Like uh, he got he's all kinds buying of farmland. Land. Yeah, yeah. It's like for, in the states. Yeah, yeah. He he's. Uh, yeah, that. Uh, if anybody wants to buy a book, there's two series of it. It's Whitney Webb, One Nation Under Blackmail, and that gets into the roots of how uh, Jeffrey Epstein developed a relationship with a lot of people from MIT and people like Bill Gates, and so the relationship goes a lot farther back than they're willing to admit. 
Yeah, I'd say it's not even just a podcast or two. It's a podcast series waiting to be fucking produced. And uh, if we weren't doing this, I'd definitely be uh, on the on the you know the. And if we didn't have full time jobs, we could totally do both and just make our lives researching this shit and then releasing both as long as we had you know as long as we were getting paid for both. But you know what I mean. Well, the one person who has done the research, and especially during COVID when she lost her job and she was living in Chile, was Whitney Webb. And so you have those two books, One Nation Under Blackmail, but you also have she did a lot of podcast series. So just YouTube her; she knows every. Thing. And her mm. research is fantastic. Mm. I'll have to check it out. Uh, here's a couple more. This concert promotion monopoly, this is from 1219. This concert promotion monopoly is telling lies to the one named permanent A-list singer about her attendance numbers at shows. They are dismal. When you are at her level and you are playing to 70% capacity, it is bad. Madonna. <gasps> really? Yep. yep. Wow. Yeah, I didn't that's see not that surprising. one coming. That's not surprising. Um, this one is the last one. Uh, okay, and then we can continue. Uh, 1227, it's the most recent. The Dark <gasps> Closet. Yeah, go ahead. Wait a second. So that blind item, what date was that? Uh, 1219. Of this year? Mm-hmm. Okay. They said Madonna recently in a Perez Hilton post last week or two weeks ago, maybe said that she made them wait three hours for mm -hmm. one of her shows. Three yep. hours. Three hours. And that could have been anything from Divadom to she was passed out. It's un three. You are not Vogue Madonna. Express yourself, Madonna, like a prayer Madonna. You're not even, you know, the 90s frozen Madonna. You are no. Granny. ancient at this yeah. point. Yeah, she needs to fucking just lay it down. Uh, anyway, this last one, The Dark Closet. This actor is foreign-born. He is A slash A minus list. He has multiple children and has had multiple relationships with famous and non-famous women. He actively tries to make it seem as if he is a playboy who goes from woman to woman like some kind of heterosexual poster boy for what a popular actor should do. It all covers for him being in the closet. He vowed at one point after a very close call to never let it happen again. He was making a movie. He was one of the male leads. He fell head over heels for a local higher production assistant in the country where the film was shot. Our actor whined and dined the assistant and got him to bed and kept him there all the time to the point the assistant got fired. Our actor told him not to worry and would make up the wages for him. Our actor never did, though, and the assistant went to the management of the actor and sent them both, sent them the photos of the assistant and the actor. Both participants were naked, but the actor was always sleeping or unaware his photo has been take, was being taken. Apparently, one of the producers had a friend who could make problems go away. One of those people paid the assistant a visit and the problem never reared its head again. Our actor vowed to never let himself out of the closet again and he hasn't for a very long time. Jude Law. Oh, I sent you a blind about Jude Law. This was like one in the past yeah. about the bearded relationship with him and Sienna Miller. Yep. And that's incredible. Yeah, it's 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 not unbelievable, and it's not he, let's, let's, knowing what we know about Hollywood. It makes perfect sense. Um, and then we just, just finished talking about how we did a, a recording recently about how um, you know it's it's the onus is on the companies to make sure that they get as much box office as possible. And if the lead is actually gay and portraying a heterosexual guy, if it's going to cost them money, they're not going to hire that person. On that basis no. alone, not that they care that he's gay or straight. The execs could be fucking gay. It's all about do women buy this person as a romantic lead? Yes or no? Yeah, it's monetary. Um, yeah. Now, Kevin Spacey got out of all of those lawsuits, right? Yep. And so I saw him on a Christmas Eve special with Tucker Carlson where he played his character, Frank. I think that's his name. I never watched the series mm -hmm. um, on Netflix. What's that called? Where he was the president. Um, you know, Which, he played the president, Kevin Spacey of that. Not House Net of Cards. Bas yeah, House of Cards. So he went on as that character. Uh -huh. And Tucker Carlson interviewed him as that character for a few minutes. It was strange, I thought. But I was like, why is he doing this? And it's because he got out of all of those lawsuits and he feels redeemed. Yep. But... Then I saw a post from somebody who is called Project Knowledge, and 
it's the Los Angeles Time headlines, and it keeps saying, okay, here's one. Report, Kevin Spacey's accuser, Linda Culkin, dead after being struck by a car. Los Angeles Times, message therapist suing Kevin Spacey for sexual assault, dies ahead of trial. Next headline, Kevin Spacey won't face criminal charges in groping case after accuser's death. Next headline, Kevin Spacey's accuser dies by suicide after actor posts kill them with kindness video. So I don't know what's going on, but that's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> I think we might want to scrub Kevin Spacey from this broadcast. <laughs> I, I was shocked by that because I didn't realize that the reason why all of these went away is because the accusers died. Well, Jesus, I guess Luca Brasi will be Luca Brasi will be playing paying me a visit pretty soon. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> anyway, guys, we're going to go with the uh, wrap up show segment first. And so here we go, guys. They eviscerate Beth. And Gary, now Beth is an author. And one of the things you and I were talking about is, you know, their husband and wife, they talk all the time. They get along unbelievably well. But now Howard's got an interviewer, and it creates some type of awkwardness. There. Yeah, it would be awesome if they could talk the way they do it. I mean, I know at home Howard will be like, we were we were looking. Th they love to look through the rag magazines and talk about people. I would oh. that would be a whole hour show for me if they would just go through Us Weekly and say what they really think about stuff. But you know, I guess Beth doesn't want to do that. But isn't isn't so Gary's completely Gary's completely outing them as being these catty little teenagers fucking on people in People magazine. Not only that, but it's just <clears throat> revealing the phoniness of whatever we get on the air. So now mm -hmm. you're hearing something like this from Gary, mm -hmm. and you're getting it greenlit by John Hine on the show saying that, yeah, that's what is going on. So what are we as listeners supposed to think then when she comes into studio or they talk to each other? Now we inherently know this is all fake and phony. Yep. Good, good job, Bowie. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is like mm -hmm. Bowie as the Wizard of Oz without the curtain. Yeah, he's just he's just back there, you know, grabbing those ropes and pulling them. Never mind the man behind the curtain. <laughs> never, never mind the man without the curtain. <laughs> yeah, I felt bad for Beth because she was sitting in my office for about twenty minutes, and we were talking, and she was telling me how nervous she was to do Letterman, and all this great ideas that she had, or that Howard Hart came up for Letterman. And then she gets on our show, and Howard starts spilling them left and right. And she's like, you know, no, I want to save. I need these ideas for the show. How tough is it? Again, this is Howard also the person who overthinks every single television performance he's on. So he's giving Beth the same anxiety. And yep. now it's twofold because not only she has to protect this bearded relationship and all these lies that have been told about how they've met – how their marriage is, et cetera, et cetera. But she has to maintain this voice in her head of Howard over her saying, this is what you need to do. And Beth is not the smartest person. She's not the brightest bulb. So she can't handle all that pressure. And then you just send her out on stage. And what happens? It's a disaster. She looks manic, yes. sometimes drunk, rambling, insane, wasting a whole two segments worth of information in one. We're going to play the Letterman. If I, I know I saved it somewhere. We're going to play the Letterman on uh, the, the Beth on Letterman appearance and uh, and go through it as well. But that, after we do this one, I know it should make it makes more sense to play it before. But either way, you guys are going to get the information. It's fine. And so, Fillmore, I have a question. Do you think I know Beth comes off as unlikable in these live appearances? But do you think that a, a lot of the unlikability should be put on the pressure Howard puts on her for the for these sorts of live appearances. Do you think some of that is on him? How I think much? part part of it is on him because he's crowbarring, he's he's forcing her for, by well coercing her, let's say, to come up with what she, what they think, what he thinks. Okay, this is going to entertain the people. This is what's going to make you a fucking star on Letterman. This is how I can make you funny. He can't himself make himself funny on Letterman. No. He thinks he's going to Svengali his way into making Beth into like fucking, you know, uh, like <laughs> Maria Bamford or something and tell some amusing anecdote on the air. And she's not likable. She's not yeah. genuine. That's the real problem. The ge and the and the problem is genuine Beth is is an idiot. She's just an airheaded dolt who writes Pittsburgh Strong and posts a fucking Pittsburgh Penguins modeling gig when there's a shooting at a goddamn synagogue 
in Pittsburgh. Uh, and then, and that was that like, that's, that's where her brain is. That would like, at least with whatever that was. And of course it was completely tone deaf and insensitive, but that was where she went immediately. So that's, so that's her. That though is the majority of celebrities. I feel like, you know, Paris Hilton after the Maui fires was posting pictures of her at Maui with her yeah. new baby, surrogate right. baby and her new husband. And they're just strolling the beach and they called back grid at Maui. I mean, that's just ridiculous. That's a lot of celebrities, though, who have that mindset. I think that Beth. She she gets pushed into this angle that's not funny by Howard, but it's also Beth doesn't actually have a story that's real to tell. That's right. So there so is nothing. Yeah. Well, the same way Howard has to be manufactured before he goes on to like, and just from everything, from the hair, the makeup, the, the, uh, the, the clothing, everything has to be just so. And the, and the, and the, 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 the funny part being this guy that claimed I go on there, I don't plan anything. I don't meet with the segment producer. I just want to go in and make it raw. My fucking ass. Mm -hmm. No, he, everything, everything on there is like fucking computer code. Yeah, it's not produced by the producers of the Tonight Show, but it's produced by your yeah your team and Beth. Same thing, but I also think when Beth gets put on um, the spot in other people's, let's say Instagram or something, there was a video I remember they were in at the Hamptons. It was summertime, and she was being catty about something. And I found that more interesting, even though it was mean girl ish. Yeah. I just thought. At least this is entertaining, like housewives entertaining. Okay. So I thought to myself, you know what? If she's going to be a mean, rich bitch, at least that I can genuinely see coming from somebody like that. Well, at least it would be organic. Right. Yeah. It, it doesn't mean it would be any more likable. I was thinking <laughs> Howard doesn't have an IT team. He has an SHIT team. <laughs> oh, yes, he does. <laughs> so, well, it, it, I was just thinking like, and like we, we mentioned it before that, that, that uh, video from her at the, um, doing that promo for that, uh, mm -hmm. pet, pet shelter thing and shoving the fucking puppy away, pulling the puppy away from that volunteer. And the people like, I, I know people think, okay, you guys are too obsessed. You're obsessing on this person. You're obsessing on his wife and all this shit. But but that was not meant to be in the frame, and it was, and it was mm -hmm. showing her what she's really like, that yes. little thing. And I've seen that in people my entire life. I've seen it usually from women who treat other women like shit. They give the side eye or they give the fucking eye roll about that person. That eye roll is not – that means way more than people will think. Well, it's – the fact – when people give a shit about it, it's like we are breaking that fourth wall – Yes. And people don't like that. They don't want that illusion to be broken. They don't want the illusion that Howard's not straight. They 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 want that illusion. They don't want it to be broken. They don't want the illusion to be broken that Beth's this caring, concerned humanitarian mm -hmm. who isn't trying to profit off of poor animals. No, instead she's squeezing piss out of kittens. Right. Um the anyway, we'll continue, guys for Howard to keep something like that to himself and off the air or off the show, like a suggestion or an idea like that. I don't know. Usually it's not that hard, but when, it, when it's hard, it seems to be very difficult. And why do you think she's so nervous about doing Letterman? I don't know. I, I can understand being nervous to do Letterman. Letterman's a whole different, you know, Letterman has a reputation, I think, for being, you know, a little bit tougher. Like, if, listen, you go on Leno's show, it's softball, softball, you know, it's, it's all – planned out letterman can throw you a curveball you know well letterman was notorious for being hard on people like lindsey lohan paris hilton where they almost made him he almost made him cry yeah i love it so you know i can understand where you would factor that in but they're obfuscating the fact that beth was on letterman yes before she, was, she supposedly she, met howard and right? she probably she probably fucked letterman too Carrying that ladder. Yep. That, that, that video, that was the, that was the one, the first time someone pointed it out. I saw when the first time I saw it, I go, Oh, holy shit. Yes. She was there. So why and would then, she be nervous? And also that whole thing of, she used to get called in to do Letterman, but as soon as she got with Howard, that stopped. 
as if to say, and I, the way they say it, the way they explain it, it's like it was Letterman's fault, his bad for not doing it. But I, I don't think for a minute it was Letterman who cut that. I think it was Howard who said, you're not doing Letterman again. Well, maybe she's nervous, and this is just my opinion, is because she did have a regular gig being that girl who carries props and they scrub the internet so well mm -hmm. that we only have that one clip of her carrying the letter being a ladder, being a brunette. Yes. And then we also have the anecdote from the blues brothers or I'm sorry, uh, um, uh, blues travelers. Yes. Lead singer. Yeah. John Popper. And he, and he wrote in his book that he met Beth backstage and said, this is Howard's secret girlfriend. Mm-hmm. So, and that was at Letterman. So I believe that the reason why she was so nervous is not because she was nervous about being on television and nervous about the way Letterman treated other celebrities. Mm -hmm. She was worried because she had an actual relationship with him before Howard and mm -hmm. was somebody who was cast in these sorts of roles. And also, if we go with the line that, you know, she was at this dinner as a escort essentially and howard <laughs> yeah, literally and she and she traded up then yeah. she was probably doing favors who knows to who in that cast of characters on the letterman show well there's i mean the other and the other thing is you know that a person like that does not get on letterman without some kind of quid pro quo so it's like howard going i'll do another appearance you know on such and such day if you put her on because letterman's not just going to go yeah have her on he uh, he tells people he tells not. the co talent coordinator no yes no yes no we had them already they were shit you think he's just going to go yeah let Howard's girlfriend come on and promote a book she knows nothing about well it's in the best interest like I said with these high profile people who have a lot of money like a Stern or a Letterman and in these positions you scratch my back I'll scratch yours so yep. anything that I find or hear coming down the pike about you fucking interns or your sexually inappropriate sort of atmosphere at that show, yep. I'm just going to ignore that and I won't expose it. But if I hear anything about Jay Leno, I'll be sure to chirp. Yep. Maybe he can, he can take the, the, the interview in a different direction. And, um, like I, a lot of people used to say Letterman can really mock you with a look. You know, he can look at the audience and make a face and everyone in the audience starts laughing. And, you know, Leno doesn't do that. So and most TV hosts don't. So he's he's very edgy or more edgy than most of those guys. Well, Beth does have a history with that show, though, and I'm guess that'll work in her favor. You know, she's not walking in cold. Yeah, right. But she even said that um, she's not even sure Dave would remember who she is. Yeah, uh, let's play that uh -huh. clip. This is Beth. Talk. That's what you tell your current beard assignment when you don't want him to get jealous. Exactly. Yeah, he has no idea yep. uh, how she's feeling about going on, Dave. I'm so nervous to do Letterman. Yeah. Really can, I tell, can I tell Robin what I think you should bring up to Letterman? How I was working on the show yeah. and loving it, and then I started dating Howard, and then they stopped calling me. I think it's a per. Why would you fucking bring that up? Because that's so awkward. Like, that's such an awkward anecdote to, to Letterman, because it's meant to make Letterman look like shit. I also don't buy that it was just Letterman letting her go based on the association. I think Howard didn't want the public to know that he's dating some background Z-list ladder carrying flacky for Letterman's show. I think that he didn't tell her the truth. Well, there's not only that. There, Howard could also, if she if she mouthed off to John Popper in nineteen, the summer of nineteen ninety eight, who was just yeah. a fucking guest, who the hell else was she telling about this all that time? I'm sure a lot of people. Mm hmm. And uh, you know, it's one of those you know, don't tell anybody, but. <laughs> when people say that, it's like I've I've had it many times, especially since I've become a certain age, when people say, hey, listen, um, you know, uh, you're not supposed to know this. And I say, well, then don't tell me. These days I go, you don't want people to know. Don't tell me. Not that you can't trust me, but the, the way to keep a secret is not to fucking tell anybody, dude. And right. But then it all ends up. I mean, look, it's, for example, like an R. Kelly yeah. married to Aaliyah at 15. I mean. All this shit, eventually it spills out. 
The well, Spengali it spills out shit people, spins people, out, spills out. People, people want it to come out. They want to be caught sometimes. They want it to, they have to feel the, the need to unburden themselves. No, if you got a secret, it's like when people say, you know, when you, um, if you cheat on your significant other and then you go, well, you got to, you got to admit it. Well, you can admit it, but then what you're doing is you are creating the hurt on them. Uh, right. Instead of you just shouldering the, the guilt and feeling pain, painful about it, uh, well, then you want someone else to take it as if to ease your conscience. In my opinion, don't fucking tell them. Keep it to yourself. It, it doesn't mean that you don't love them or whatever else. Just keep it to yourself. I don't think you're being altruistic or you're trying to be whatever. Other people may beg to differ and they may think, oh, well, no, you should be fully honest. Sometimes the honesty is not going to help you in that situation. Yeah, but we have like really good relationships. I I never know how to respond to people who have bad relationships and find themselves in predicaments like this because I just feel like you grow out of it and the person that you're with, you just would never imagine or could imagine hurting them. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, but that's something uh, there's – I don't know, weak wills. There's people that, uh, you know, get drunk and some shit like that happens. You know what, what film I just w watched recently? Um, uh, it's a blast from the past. Did you, did you ever see Disclosure with Michael Douglas and Demi Moore? I don't think so. Basically, it's about a guy. Uh, she becomes uh, his superior in this computer company. And then uh, you know, imagine Demi Moore knowing about computers. And then um, so it's like science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> and then but Michael Douglas is pissed because he's passed over for promotion. Then he got, and, but they had a relationship when they were younger. And then um, she's meet, goes, she agrees to meet with him. And then she comes on to him and she tells him, you know, she's basically his boss and she's coming on to him. Then she, she when he refuses, she gets pissed off. And then she. Uh, threatens to out him she accuses him of sexual harassment but he was the one who wow. was sexually harassed it's a great it's a good it's entertaining i don't know that it's a great film dennis miller's in it barry levinson directed it wow i gotta see this now i'm yeah, interested it's definitely worth it there's a lot of there's quite a few people in it that uh donald sutherland plays the boss the overall boss it's Ooh. it's 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 dated but it's an it's an interesting uh viewing That's at a any good rate cast yeah, check it out, Disclosure. And and it just makes me think of, you know, basically he tried to keep it from his wife because he thought he could deal with it, well, like basically internally and it wouldn't have to get back to her. But eventually it does, and then it's a whole rigmarole. I won't give it away, but guys, but definitely check it out. But this plot you're describing, doesn't this describe a lot of these Hollywood situations where they start coupling up and then there's this mythology given to them? Mm -hmm. And then... When these cracks start to show or these anecdotes about, oh, but she was on Letterman or she was at this dinner, or whatever, or Cabby's there, Ralph's yeah. there, you Suddenly know, it just, starts to, there. it just starts to disintegrate real quick. Well, that's that's the problem. That's why people are become such archivists of, of, of Hollywood. Like, uh, who's the guy that did... Um, God, that that there's that book, The Comedians. I can't remember his name, um, but he basically researched podcast after book after podcast and put together some kind of delineated history of the comedy business from the vaudeville days to present day and addressed some scandals, including Robin Williams being a joke thief and, you know, like certain like, you know, mafia interventions by certain people who had connections like uh, Swifty Lazar and shit like that. Um, Dice in his book, I love it. He talks about having a problem with some guy, some Brooklyn mafia guy, and that he got in touch with his agent and his agent said the problem went away. <laughs> what do you mean the problem went away? I mean, the problem went away. Yeah. Literally. The Ray li Donovan types. Yes. And, uh, and it was like, yeah, and, and don't want to mention it. He basically contacted an uncle of his or something like that. It was, um, it was an unbelievable story. Um, let's keep going guys. Perfect idea. Yeah, I would like to know Dave's answer to that. I love that you're going on. I mean, that's that a legitimate question. Yeah. And yeah, I don't think he'll get upset. I think we'll find out what he knows about this. Robin, I loved working on that show. Do you think she should ask that question? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I mean, do I think I, you know, if I didn't know Beth, she should, hell yeah, she should ask that question. But then you could put your, you know, if you're opening it up, you don't want, you don't want to make him uncomfortable or you don't want him to come back and make her uncomfortable. It almost seems like Howard proposing this is tweaking a bear. Like he knows the answer, but he knows that whatever he has Svengali in the background knows that that question won't be answered honestly, because mm -hmm. both of them know 
essentially what how their relationship galvanized and the relationship between Beth and the entertainment industry before she even met Howard, which included Letterman. So to me, this feels like something that Howard does regularly where he has this macho, confident type speak about something because he knows that no matter what, the answer that's going to be given is the one he wants because he's already bullied himself into getting that response. Well, you know what? But going in there to ask a question, you already know the answer to most likely, and um, and and trying to make clearly, it's about to make Dave uncomfortable, and it's doing something. You know, it's not like he he would have someone go on and ask Letterman when he was still there. Hey, what happened to Vinny Favalli? You know what I mean? Who who got scandalously dumped from Colbert? Right, or uh, going on, you know. Uh, the Tonight Show and saying, what happened to hey, Joan Rivers? <laughs> yeah, ask, or ask Jimmy Fallon, hey, I heard you like to drink. <laughs> right. No. You, know, you know, doing this on the purpose, because that's always been Howard's MO. Make someone uncomfortable, ask some questions. But if the reverse happened, imagine Howard with a talk show and he's a host and you go on and say, so what was the story about Allison? You fucked around on her, didn't you? Well, we did get a little bit of that when Wendy Williams pressed him on, oh, I saw your dude. Mm -hmm. And she said... And he goes, what, dude? Oh, Artie. Oh, Artie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you saw how he reacted. Like, he he had right. nothing to say. And he couldn't say anything. So you imagine him in a, per, in a public, like, cameras are on. It's rolling, dude. And this is your moment to come back and show you that you're the Johnny Carson of your generation, that you could actually, you know, mix it up with people. And the truth is, he's never been able to, unless he has no. a script in front of him. And I think Beth, when when Beth's saying, you know, I want to know what happens, I want to ask this question. I'm 70-30. I'm 70% that she doesn't know that Howard in the background probably had something to do with her being eliminated from the Letterman show as an extra and yep. doing that work. And I'm 30% that maybe she does know and she's just posing this question to make interesting radio and speculation. Maybe. Do you think Howard should come along and sit in the green room? Well, I get why he doesn't want to. I, I I totally get it. It's not like I'm too famous to sit there. It's like it's Beth's moment where it just it will always feel like he's overshadowing her. Yeah, but to take Beth's side of it, she wants him there. You know, she wants to share the moment with with him. Right. I think he, I think he thinks it's hard to look cool. It is. I, I was sitting in the green room once too, and they did like a shot of Beth, and I was sitting next to her. And then like the next day, I got all these letters about like what you know, look at the shitty outfit you're wearing. Like it's hard to look cool. What do you wave? It's like you know, it's hard to look cool just sitting on camera. Jason in Baltimore, welcome to the wrap-up show. Hey, what's up, guys? Hey, Jason. Hey, um, I wanted to get your opinion, your honest opinion, if you're able to. Um, Beth said that she would have dated Letterman had he asked her. And then Howard, I heard him say later that uh, afterwards she tells him uh, she was just playing the game and that she wouldn't really do that. But I thought her answer to that was completely genuine. And uh, she realized that she probably screwed up. What do you guys think? Well, I don't think she screwed up. I think, she, listen, if Howard didn't, didn't exist and she's working on the show, she cl she clearly likes Letterman, like thinks he's funny. So he's like, if you, you know, asking somebody out and saying you go on a date with him is different than saying you'd bang him. What? Sure, sure. Because she, she, the, the caller was asking, like, if she if she was asked if you if Letterman no, had asked I, you out, would you have gone with him? She would say yes. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying what to the fact that Gary. Oh, in okay. his naivety is saying, yeah. oh, yeah, just because she's going to go out with him doesn't mean she's going to bang him. As if a celebrity of that stature wouldn't know exactly what he's buying. No kidding. Well, I, so, I just I just kind of thought that uh, Howard got a little, uh, you know, touchy about that. When, you know, obviously if, if she's on the show and she doesn't know Howard and she's going to date him, why can't she answer truthfully and say yes? I, obviously he was upset with it and she said, oh, no, I was just playing the game. That is some bullshit. I don't, think, I don't think he was upset with it. I think he was, you know, I, upset isn't the right word, but, yeah, probably sort of, you know, I don't know what, what would be the right word for it. Jealous. Yeah. Okay. He's probably a little uh, jealous. <laughs> jealous and upset. What's the difference? It's it's he's upset with it because it reveals her character. Yes. Meaning, she was in this game to land a Howard Stern or land a David Letterman, yeah. and whatever opportunity presented itself first, she took. Yeah. As as uh, Sal would say, she bagged the whale. Well, that's right. But with Letterman, I believe he's straight. And if she were to 
do that versus Howard, she wouldn't have some long term um, legitimacy as a wife. She would just be a behind the scenes bang mistress who would probably get some purses, maybe an, maybe money to pay for an apartment, some car rides, some perks in that nature. But she yeah. wasn't going to be getting the she wasn't going to be getting a title the way that she would get with a beard contract with Howard. Well, certainly not. Yeah. Letterman being married, Howard unmarried. It's a no brainer there. Sort of. Well, so it is and it isn't. They're both fucking deceased. They're both social miscreants, Letterman and, and Howard in their own way and deviants. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, you're like that. That would be the one deal breaker. The one one is clearly unavailable and maybe richer. Who knows? Maybe more prominent, maybe more famous, but not. Yeah, it's not as it's not as good a catch. In terms no. of, you know, getting your hooks in and then maybe having a kid with Howard. Right. And that wife of his did get a kid from mm-hmm. Letterman later in life, which yep. Beth never got, even though it was stated in the Richie Wilson interview that she did want a kid. And she expressed that um, at some point they talked about it regularly with Richie Wilson's wife. We got that from the uh, landing I- the plane interview. Uh, I don't know if we mentioned that, but I definitely we definitely had the audio of Doug Goodstein's uh, wife having the conversation with Beth and then Doug Goodstein's wife, Marlo, or I think they kept calling her Marla, uh, Marlo getting on the TV on the uh, phone and then telling Howard, no, she was just a comp- commented on, you know, how it's too, it's too bad. She wasn't going to be able to talk about having a kid, you know, like the rest of her girlfriends were and stuff right. like that. And Howard got like, Oh, (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) I love that. That was so telling. But I think Howard's ultimately just jealous. Not jealous. I think he's embarrassed of the fact that when she revealed that she would have dated Letterman, it reveals a little bit more of her character to the audience. Yep. But not like, not like I'm jealous. I'm going to kill you. Like I'm jealous. You know, people get jealous all the time in a relationship. And Beth should have known better than to answer that question like that. Come on. Well, she's being honest, and that was. Yeah, she was being honest. She realized that was a mistake. Well, that was that was right around when she also got the Sophie's Choice question about which pet she would save, and that oh, that, yeah. that, that totally threw her for a loop. I you know, thought. you know what I loved? She she had such a genuine uh, response. She she said something. And she goes. What kind of disgusting <laughs> question? Like she was like, "What is wrong with you?" That was so funny. <laughs> Oh man, that's it. It's great. I mean, it's such a. I mean, what it what it ass and I question to ask her of all people, which pet would you keep? I know. Well, thank you, Jason, for calling in. Let's talk to Augie in North Carolina. Augie, you're on the wrap up show. Oh wow! Hey man, thanks for taking my call. Hey, um, how you know? I had to just turn the show off today. When some guy's wife or girlfriend comes in, she wouldn't <laughs> get that book on any place or anywhere. She wouldn't be on Letterman. If she didn't know Howard. And it's like I, I call her Ono oh, Stern. <laughs> I mean, oh my God! Come on, I disagree. I, I don't disagree with. The, listen, Beth said. I the disagree. Why I don't getting, disagree. Yeah, no, Bowie, Bowie. Bowie's like scrambling. <laughs> He's like a cat on ice. <laughs> I disagree. I don't disagree. Yeah. Well, this publicity is because she's Howard Stern's wife, so she's not acting like that's not true. So that part she already admitted. I don't call her Ono because she's not taking all of Howard's money and, and you know, doing crazy shit with it, making him, you know, what was Yoko doing? People of Earth saving the world? Well, I'm- Okay. Well, at least in, in defense of Yoko Ono, John died. So... <laughs> You know, whatever she does with her legacy after or his legacy after the fact, he's not alive to say one way or another. In this case, it's no comparison. And in in his defense, he was a fucking beetle. He was rock and roll royalty and could have done anything he wanted just about any time in his life. And she did a great job keeping away the abuse secrets. <laughs> Yeah, well, Jesus, that, that was he was. It's funny about you read about Lennon, especially, and not I'm just talking about the Albert Goldman book, but the um, the in general the stories you hear about him and the interviews you have with Lennon, with Julian Lennon and stuff. He was mm-hmm. a, a real shithead, John Lennon. Like he was a genius songwriter, great performer, all that shit. But he was also in a, ma- a massive prick. Yeah, I mean, he seemed like he was on a massive amount of drugs a lot. 
Uh, yeah, especially during the 70s. And there's that lost period where he did nothing and he called himself a house husband and he was looking after the one kid, but actively like kind of neglected his first kid and his first, first wife, you know, and I mean, that, you know, that's his business and that's his life. But you have to, you know, if you're going to talk about him, you should talk about every aspect of his life, including the the the, the, the dirtier, seedier aspects. With that said, I do think that there are some things like the talent of John Lennon, the songwriting ability, the lyrics and things that transcend somebody's own personal human experience that, sure. you know, those messages just relay through the pangs of time that I am grateful for. So regardless of his personal life, it doesn't take away from the body of work that I think is just right. amazing. He Right. He still released and made Strawberry Fields Forever. And uh, yeah, I don't think I mean, it's it's one of those things. If you found out he had a fucking Jeffrey Epstein kind of operation. Yeah, I don't believe he'd be able to listen to his music again. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> See, the my running joke was, you know, Michael Jackson might have molested some fucking kids, but he also wrote PYT. And uh, yeah. that's that's the jam. <laughs> I, I <laughs> yeah. You know, if he, That's if what, but is, I mean, I Michael feel Jackson the same was way. accused. Michael Jackson was accused, but never convicted. Does it make it less meaningful when a song becomes part of a zeitgeist that speaks to a, I don't know, a humanitarian or a aspect of life that transcends the person who wrote it? Then I think it just becomes into. I I think it elevates it to a certain field where it doesn't matter where it came from, the message, the sentiment kind of overrides it well it can it, it all depends on the individual like it's what you what or what overshadows what for you like does the song or does the movie become more than the scandal behind the person who was involved in it and that's up to a, every person to decide their line where i know i can't watch films by this but like alfred hitchcock if you read about right. you know all about oh, him you, you know i love him <laughs> and but i mean it does it enough to dissuade you from ever watching you know vertigo again no, it's, that's the point. I, I think the art is transcends Separate. the person. So you have to, once it becomes a part of somebody's public frame of reference and people love it and it makes a cultural statement and a moment in time, I just think that means more than what the person who created it stands for and does. I think that you can look at that separately and take that not take it away, but take it as if something it that means more. Yeah. Yeah. Separating the two. I mean, John Lennon couldn't record a song. Like he couldn't go to the right. studio without having right. Yoko by his side. Perfect. That's not the case here with Howard and Beth. Howard does right. show but almost every day without Beth. Regardless of what I would say, you defend them like mad. Yeah, I mean, it's well, so, but, but, it's but, so but I agreed with the first part. She agreed with the first part. Well, the first okay. thing she said when she walked in was, yeah, I'm a celebrity's wife who wrote a book. She she totally but, acknowledged that. But that doesn't interest you at all? Like, oh. let, leave out Howard. Like, when someone's married to someone. God, no, it's not interesting at all. It's this, <laughs> this, this, this rich, broad, it's, it's her hobby. You know how many silly rich broads have those silly hobbies? No, no, but, I, but when sure. someone, like, who's someone that you're interested in, in, in the life? So I look at this, this first, oh, my dog. This was the first cash grab, in my opinion. But it didn't make nearly um, the amount that I think they either thought or put her in a position to do anything better after. I mean, it didn't position her in any way. It just got her on some fluffy talk shows to promote it. And the sales were what the sales were. I think they realized this. And so what came next from this was the plan. So the book was the launch, but the plan was the 5013C, which every rich person does as a tax haven write-off, and where they use and spend and have accounts, and this is what I think was Beth's furry friends, Bianca's furry friends scandal. Well, I think that uh, in inherently this was this the oh my dog was prefaced by this one clip that again I should have played but I'll, maybe I'll play these out of order but fuck it and, and you know you get it all together normally we're better thought out than this guys but it didn't occur to me until after I started this that we could make a whole saga of the 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 book thing and and just 
take it piece by piece once in a while. He started talking about how she's having problems with Microsoft Word. She's writing her book. I hate this fucking book. I wish she never started this, all this crap. And then, but you're right. It didn't become pet caves. It didn't become, uh, you know, the what is spoiled rotten pets or whatever. Like it didn't become something that became her wheelhouse and something he could palm off on her and say, well, that's her thing. She's busy. She's making some money. This is successful. So it's no longer just tax write off. It's, oh, she's actually in getting income because she was probably saying, what can I do? I need to do right. something. And giving Don Buckwald like and Howard's going, fuck, can you get her something well, just to shut what, her the fuck up? This is why. You see, and I call this the transitional period where she was doing things like fashion shows. Um, She was doing fashion makeovers for Howard TV. True beauty. She was doing some sort of reality gigs, the poker thing for that one network with uh, the Soprano character and Scott Stapp. Scott Stapp. Yeah, Stapp, sorry, from Creed. And so she had this... I guess it, it's like, I, I don't she know how to explain it. She was scrambling was for scrambling. a gig. Yeah, yeah. She was scrambling for some permanent gig where she had something but to do. But not just a gig. It was more like she was scrambling for a message and a brand. Yes. That how can I brand myself? And so when she wrote this book, I thought this was the catalyst to, oh, my brand is going to be pet. Pets, and animals yeah. mm-hmm. and that works out great because then we can leverage this into a charity and eventually we're going to get this this status of a 5013c and eventually we're going to be able to profiteer from this tax write off this tax haven this and it's going to be all this shit and they do just exactly what every other shell company bullshit charity does that celebrities start that don't mean a lot yeah, but I mean, at the same time, it's like uh, they're they're doing whatever they can to see what's what sticks to the wall, and well, this, yeah. But they but but they themselves have no idea what's going to hit, and they don't. I I think even Don was saying, look, no, internally at least to himself was saying, no one likes her. She's not right. going to get anything. Nothing's going to stick. She's unlikable. The only way to crowbar her into something is if the other people are interesting enough to cover for her, and that never well, happened. I- I think during this time, though, this is why during those hosting, sporadic hosting gigs like E! News and whatever else she was doing, or I'm sorry, it wasn't E! Um, News, it was uh, Entertainment extra? Tonight, Extra, okay. Extra, thank you. Yeah. Um, whatever, they're all the same. She, she was she was pushed into these different hosting gigs mm-hmm. and falling flat on all of them. Mm-hmm. And so... I truly believe that that's what she wanted to do. And if it wasn't going to be that, then it was going to be some sort of fashion consultant that came on like different talk shows to promote what she thought was this year's fall fashion or this year's line for spring. You know what I'm saying? This makeover, like let's get, let's give this makeover to this dad or whatever. And that didn't work because she doesn't have the personality to carry that. And her fashion is terrible inherently. So, guys, in the middle of this, we decide, I decided off the cuff, let's get that infamous Chelsea Handler interview on, I guess, Extra um, Mm -hmm. that uh, Beth did back when she was the aforementioned gig that Sam was talking about. And this was one of the more... Like, it's funny because you got Chelsea Handler was famous because she fucked the the head of E to get a job. Yep. She's completely unfunny and untalented like Beth, but she managed to get ahead being she did the proper grifting thing. So she's interviewing being interviewed by Beth. She knows Chelsea knows who Beth is and she has no respect for her, much like she has no respect for anybody. But the disdain in this and I've never liked Chelsea Handler. I always thought she was a cunt. But the, the, the look that she's giving Beth is actually kind of amusing. It's amusing, and the, I appreciate this look and this uh, behavior from Chelsea Handler. I will say I enjoyed some of the Chelsea Handler show back in the day on E!, not necessarily because of her, but I liked Heather, um, the comedian who then failed on her own talk show, uh, or I'm sorry, Whitney, Whitney, uh, Whitney Cummings? What's her name? Whitney Cummings. Yeah, she was on that show regularly. And Ross, he's mm-hmm. a gay comedian. He was on that show a lot. And I like the panel. Okay. So there but, was some a- there was some aspect to it you like, but not necessarily her. 
Exactly. Okay. Hey, Mario. It's two blondes at the beach. I'm so lucky I'm hanging out with Chelsea Handler. Hey, Chelsea. Hi, girl. Our Hamptons magazine is such a big deal, especially I live in the Hamptons. And you look so beautiful. Oh, thank you. Do you love it? Are you happy? This is my first time here. This is like my first day ever here. Yes, and I'm having a great time. Did literally today? Yeah, well, last night I flew in, but we had to land in New Jersey because of the fog, in quotes. Right. So then two and a half hours later, I started to like it. So and I, I took a long nap. You did? Well, you look refreshed. Uh, what? Thank you. Um, I heard that you have thoughts to move to the to the East Coast and oh, maybe come really? yeah, oh, I hear. I know. Thank you for letting me know about my thoughts. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> so is it something that Chelsea's attitude always fucking irked me? And, and that was that 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 type of attitude. But at least I like that she was giving Beth shit for our, our purposes. But um, <sighs> she it, it's like she can't conceal she she can't she can she could play the game by fucking to get ahead but she couldn't play the game by being phony nice ever not and phony talented and yes. so you have these situation oh well i live in the hamptons so she has this humble brag in between saying and uh and she just sounds so over eager and she actually sounds nervous and yeah. it's strange well, Beth does, but Chelsea. What I'm saying is, Chelsea. That's what I mean. Can't, Chelsea, Chelsea can't fake anything, any kind of disdain. No, she is just off a plane and is now getting asked if she's going to move to the. Are you going to move to East Ham Coast? <laughs> <laughs> you got that too. New NBC show. Thank Let's you. talk about that. Okay. Tell me, tell me about it. Well, it's based on one of my books, Are You There, Vodka? It's me, Chelsea. And it's uh, kind of takes place, like, you know, it's very loosely based. So it kind of takes place about 10 years ago. And I play my older Mormon sister who's pregnant. But she might be born again Christian. It's hard to keep up. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> <laughs> It sounds like, you know, like the Beavis. <laughs> if she does that without Chelsea, I'd love to be able to isolate that and just use those as drops. <laughs> how, how, like, crazy and high does she sound? You know? Ooh, Ch- it Chelsea? sounds like somebody. No. Beth, she sounds like she's on coke. Like, <laughs> okay, so tell me about this. <laughs> are, you, are you convinced she had a serious blow problem? Oh, yes. Like. You know. I, I'm not even joking. I just, to me, this sounds so coked up. Well, it wouldn't surprise me to, if she had to, to, to do something like that to give her some kind of pep or she thought she was too boring or whatever. I'll speed myself up by doing a blow, doing a blast. But to do this gig, I mean, this this is such a cherry gig, these fucking hosting things. All you have to do is stick a mic in people's mouths and and word whatever you're supposed to word. Boom. They do all the heavy lifting, supposedly. But Beth is so narcissistic and can't see that that like she's lucky to even have this because she's so not talented as maybe somebody who was a journalist and actually went mm-hmm. to journalism school <laughs> or something, you know, who deserves the job out of college. Who was the so- one that used to who was the one that used to was it was it Julie Bowen that used to do? Um, uh, no, it wasn't. Uh, who was it that used to do these interview type things for extra? God, it'll 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 kill me. Anyway, she was just like like eye candy, essentially, as they all are. But at least she, you know, she didn't flub stuff. She didn't fake laugh. She was just very like proficient. I can't remember her name. Jules Asner is who I was thinking of. You just watch Beth with the microphone, and it's like she doesn't know what she's doing. <laughs> she's holding it like a wrench. <laughs> Here we go. Anyway, it's a sitcom, so it's not my usual pace of things. So it's a little bit out of my comfort zone. So I'm just executive producing and um, hoping for the best. Now, is Roseanne Barr attached to it? No, no, no. no. We were just talking about her coming on the show. There's no official attachment, you know. Hopefully, that would be great. And then big movie with Reese Witherspoon. When does yeah. that start? Yeah, that, oh, I did that. It comes out in the fall. Was it so fun? It was. Is she so cute? She is. You She's guys look really alike. cute. No. Oh, the- my. Do, 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 do. Do you hear the pace of this interview? This yeah. is manic. Can I can I just re- rewind that real quick? That one little exchange. Sure. Okay. There's no official attachment, okay. you know. Hopefully, that would be great. And then big movie with Reese Witherspoon. When does yeah. that start? That- First of all, she said Reese Witherspoon. <laughs> it's 
it's mind blowing. That oh, I did that. It comes out in the fall. Is it so fun? It was. Is she so cute? She is. You she guys look really alike. Cute. No. no. <laughs> do you live alone? Oh alone. No. Uh, no. Own a own a rent. Rent. <laughs> what? Wait, when do they look alike? Because they have the same hair color. That's it. No, you do. The blonde, the eyes. insulted if you said that. I don't she think so. Be. You're, you're so good. last night that we looked alike, and she was like, no, I'm insulted. I, I don't believe that for a second. Let's talk about your book, because I just got a copy, and I just read it, and I'm in love with Chunk, your rescue dog. Oh, isn't he the best? Oh, my God. And I, I love the lie of Chunk. So oh. what, were there anything, were there anything that, of, of the stories that surprised you, what people remember what? of your lies? Were there anything of the story? Were there, Were there anything, there of, the anything of the story? And she tried to rephrase it, but it's so stupid. Me, she just said the <laughs> same thing. Let me try that again. Hold on. Let's talk about your book because I just got a copy and I just. You're right. She's coked up. Listen to her. You're, I let's told not you. What do you think? It. I don't notice this? <laughs> <laughs> you have your own experience. I, I don't believe that for a second. Let's talk about your book because I just got a copy and I just read it and I'm in love with Chunk, your rescue dog. Oh, isn't he the best? Oh my God. And I, I love the lie of Chunk. So oh. what, were there anything, were there anything that, of, of the stories that surprised you, what people remembered your lies or you were. <laughs> this is every party I went to after going to a club and there's just a bunch of people in the kitchen telling me what company they're starting. It's like, <laughs> you know, oh, I'm going to start. We're going to start a like, company. Uh, oh, okay. I remember Bill Graham told this story. when they, You remember the, um, you know, the, the music video, The Last Waltz? No. Oh, the, with the band. It was the band with Bob Dylan, Neil Young, Joni Mitchell. It was, a, there was an actual DVD. And it was filmed at Winterland, I think. And basically, they said this was the era of the overindulgence of cocaine. So Bill Graham had a room, a green room set up in the back that was painted white. It was okay. all white, white furniture, white cushions, white everything. Then they had a glass table with black edges. And on the oh. table and on the wall were all these Groucho Marx noses and mustaches. Oh, Groucho wow. Mar they, they took away the mustaches, so they just put the noses all over the wall. And then they had all tons of coke on the table. And when you went in the room, there was a loop and the, the audio, all you heard was a sniffing sound every time you walked in. <laughs> That's hilarious. I uh, listened to an interview. Danny DeVito said that uh, him and Arnold Schwarzenegger, when they were doing twins, they got invited to a party and Arnold Schwarzenegger's name is longer than his. And they both had their names written out in cocaine. Mm -hmm. And so he was so happy that his was so much longer. It's a Danny. <laughs> Look at how. <laughs> Longer my name is just so like doing a ton of blow. Wow, Jesus! Mm -hmm. Danny, Danny was doing the, the him. They were both doing cloak. Oh yeah. Oh wow, impressive. That's a lot. Of, or called on. Well, I, yes, it was surprising to read it, but I edited it, so I wanted to make sure that I looked as awful as possible because <laughs> that's kind of my first and foremost goal is to always be as self-deprecating as possible because if you make a living making fun of people i think you should start with yourself so i did that and then i added a lot at the end and then i put in a lot of pictures so it was a way to put a book out without doing all the work so i mean i wish i had thought of that for mine i, I think wish i had thought of it <coughs> oh my, my, me me two, two people who didn't do fuck all for their own books <laughs> and on top of it chelsea handler does not take kindly to people making fun of her ask anybody who makes fun of her for her i'm childless and see what i can do when i'm childless and hop on a plane to switzerland and this and that and she makes these instagrams and it's like fuck you lady it's not because we have kids we can't jump on a plane to switzerland it's because we're working class or poor yeah big time a lot earlier now, is your boyfriend afraid you're going to lie to him because you wrote a book on uh, people to lie? I'd have to find out who he is. Yeah. Something called on extra the world what? according to. <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> so she doesn't have a boyfriend. And Beth just blew right by that in this fucking coked up interview listener. She's like, okay, so. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> oh, let me put this one back. Hold on. So it was a way to put a book out without doing all the work. So, I mean, I wish I had thought of that for mine. I, I think wish I had thought of it a lot earlier. <laughs> Now, is your boyfriend afraid you're going to lie to him because you wrote a book on uh, people to lie? I'd have to find out who he is. Uh, Something called on extra the world <laughs> according to. We'll see. Okay. So I'm going to throw out some hot topics okay. and you're going to give me your thoughts. What about um, Arnold Schwarzenegger's um, 
cleaning yeah. lady. I think she looks a lot like George Lopez. <laughs> you see, that was awesome. And um, he said that if he goes through sex rehab, that he has chances to get Maria back. Do you believe that to be true? No, I think that when he comes home every day, he's like, who's home? <laughs> it took a minute. Um, Jersey Shore, do you what? love it? <laughs> that took a minute. <laughs> she Jersey. couldn't figure it out. I am in shock at how bad this is. I, I forgot, forgot how, how bad, bad this, this was. Hold on, let me let me go through that one more time. Awesome. And um, he said that if he goes through sex rehab, that he has chances to get Maria back. Do you believe that to be true? No, I think that when he comes home every day, he's like, "Who's home?" <laughs> it's like a minute um jersey shore do you love it you've interviewed all of them well yes because i have to but um <laughs> me too for I'm extra jersey so <laughs> oh. Oh. oh my god <laughs> me too for Andy extra warhol gonna pop out of her dress listen to her <laughs> This is brutal. Guys, those of you watching this, I'm sorry, those of you listening to this, I'm going to put up the YouTube video. I please, please watch at least this segment for, for, for the purpose of just seeing how bad it is. I've souped up the original audio on YouTube. It's barely audible. It's really low. And I'm going to uh, make sure I'm going to actually cut this, export it and put it up on our Facebook page to have forever. Okay, because it looks like Beth just literally rode off the horse like Bianca Jagger into Studio 54 into this interview, completely coked out of her mind. Fuck, a Clydesdale and fucking blow. No, I don't love it, but it's it makes me look better. going to be the next Oprah? Um, I guess Sherry Shepard. She's black. Kardashian's 20 carat engagement ring. That's a cubic zirconia. He's not even a starter. I think she, Howard thinks that she bought it. She probably did. Her mom probably bought it. Um, dancing with the stars, would you do it? No, I have a job. <laughs> oh, extra. And then doesn't it remind you that time when uh, Howard goes, uh, they, you know, they've offered uh, Beth uh, dancing with the she, stars. I don't want her to do that. <laughs> she, uh, it, was a, it was a literal deliberation for so many days, too. Yeah. Say, hey, honey, your book's not that exciting. Just like, say, say somebody talks about their movie on the Howard Stern show and he immediately cuts them off because it's boring. Same thing. Some boring broad, some boring rich broad, I, like, I want to hear about her book. I mean, who cares if she admits it? It's That's even more to say that she shouldn't be there. Oh, yeah, oh my that, God. That person fucking nailed it. But that is exactly how everybody felt. It's so interesting to me that... Even though we have these clips and so much evidence that so many listeners felt like this, Beth still got elevated and she's still known for being this pet person. It, it's it, it's it's a lack of a forth, forethought from Howard and a lack of it, it's more like that whole narcissism. It's my wife. It's more my beard or at the time, whatever, my fucking girlfriend. We're going to allow this. Uh, I'm going to allow this regardless of what my fans think, which has always been his way. But if he really cared about the entertainment factor or knew about the entertainment factor, what makes his show good, he would never have her on ever. Well, it it just says so much to me that the fact that these people and it's not just Beth, it's a lot of people you think, how do they get to be known for this or that or the other? And then you go back and you realize, oh, it's because they were just trying to find their brand. It has yeah. nothing to do with genuine anything. Yeah. Do you have any pets? Yeah, I have three dogs. Yeah, and I've got a cat, and I've got a tenant who lives downstairs. I take care of their dog. Yeah. Oh, do you I get do you get paid to take care of that dog? No, I don't. No. Because we were talking about how much Robin get pays her. Uh, how much did she say? Cat what that, what I thought you said like, do, what does that have to do with it? You're changing the subject. To <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're changing the subject. And what do rich people who pretend to care about pets, but then pay people to actually do the minimal work that is required? But also they got Bianca from a fucking breeder. And they overfed her.
Oh, Christ. And all the cats. I mean, he she, recently you posted a picture of, of Beth. It's an old pic, but it's her on the elevator or whatever with that the mm-hmm. iPhone selfie with Howard. Yeah. Like the fucking Grim Reaper right behind her. Right. And I'm thinking, you know, that that iPhone Pro has the three lenses, like wide, mm-hmm. whatever, I'll zoom and all that shit. And I'm thinking one lens for every eye plucked out of a cat this week. No kidding. I saw a TikTok of a, a actual animal rescue person and mm-hmm. it was showing pictures of Beth's Instagram and talking about overfeeding cats because mm-hmm. it was just bowls of kit like kittens around bowls that were s- filled to the brim. That is not how you take care of a cat. Aren't you supposed to give it like the cans I know they look like little hockey pucks. One can yes. is supposed to be enough for a cat, right? Any, there, any it, for an adult cat. An adult cat, like wet food or dry food, it depends on what they like. Henry likes both, but we don't feed them. I don't feed him when the bowl's empty because right. he would eat all day if I did that. And he's right. already big enough as it is. He's too yeah. big. I yeah. think I, I'm trying to cut down now. Like he's having to deal with me putting him on a diet because he's getting a little bit too big where I'm like a little bit worried about his weight. But he's not mm-hmm. fat. He's just a big cat in general. He's large. He's long. He needs to be doing more running around basically. Yeah, but it's hard in Buffalo, and I understand that. And so, but you, I don't feed the bowl to the brim of dry food and then feed the bowls of the wet food to the brim at the same time. I mean, that's oh, just nuts. No. And that's what and she it, does. Well, and like she, she would probably argue, well, you know, there's multiple cats and they're sharing bowls. That's why they're full. No, you give them their own bowl. You give them like separate bowls and they'll go to separate bowls. If they, if they see there's two bowls, they won't both go to the same one. Exactly. And depending on the personality of the cat, the dominant cats will rule over all the bowls. Yes. You might have to move them to different rooms and feed them in different places so that they know that they're there or call the cat. Hey, you know, like Ginger, come on over. Da, 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 da. And then you give them the bowl right there somewhere away from the crowd. And that's why you see a lot of her rescue cats. Some of them are really, you know, not, they don't look fed. They don't look well. And then some look so porky. Yeah. They look, they look like the fucking stevedores. Text your boss. <laughs> no, I'm talking. What are you, you talking about? So, you guys are so. Uh, Augie, Augie, we, Augie, we answered your question. We let you speak your no, mind. You, didn't. you said that I asked you if you had pets. She wrote a book about pets. This isn't coming out of left field. All right. Yes, what it is. What does that have to do with five pets? She wrote a boring book, and that she. How do you know it's boring? You haven't even fucking looked at it. Because her book's about is a reference guide to taking care of pets. Oh, it's wow! Re- so, it's, it's relevant. You know how many people have written a stupid, boring book that are never going to get on Letterman and Howard Stern? It's an Ono oh situation. You don't get that. It's not an Ono oh so situation at all. Trying to publish your book and make money. So I don't like the comparison to Ono. Oh like I don't because at least Yoko Ono. Oh if you look back in it, especially the series they did with the with in their bed and, you know, protesting for peace in the Vietnam War, mm-hmm. I think that there was some artistic value to Yoko Ono. I don't like her music, but I think that there is some iconic artistic value to the statements they made in imagery towards I, being protesting things that were very controversial at the time. Yeah, but the parallel where, where it works is who the fuck would know about Yoko Ono if she wasn't married to John Lennon? No, I agree with you. That's that. But, that's where the comparison is apt. It doesn't mean that when she... But, but the diff- more, the difference not, is... Hold on, hold on. The difference is o- Yoko Ono released albums and then they were... People bought them. Like, people actually paid money for Yoko Ono albums. And then she would perform on stage and stuff. Beth doesn't go with Letterman and sit down on the couch with Howard ever. No. She didn't go, you know, like, uh, you know, to... But that was she, a lot of John's doing. What, him pro crowbarring into the... Yeah. Crowbarring her? Yeah, of course. Because he wanted her... He was saying, this isn't like some situation. She didn't break up the Beatles. And in fact, that whole thing doesn't hold any weight. It, I'm sure they didn't like having her in the studio. But the fact is, the, the be- breakup was going to happen whether you had six Yoko Onos or not. Right. He, she, he was very controlling over her, too. Yes, he was. And then, so, and then later on, he gave her the he she was wearing the fucking pants in the family, and he was doing fuck all. Right, exactly. And I think that Yoko, when you say like, oh, well, you know, she wouldn't be known. Of course, she wouldn't be known. 
But most celebrity wives who don't have a career on their own in the limelight aren't known. So I think that that's a little unfair. If she wants to use her platform by being with this person to elevate some of her poetry or some of the things that she wanted to do and the fact that John Lennon pushed her to do this. I think a lot of Beth is she's not as to me personally, it's not as terrible. It's not a like, it's not a like for like situation. Right. I, well, that's what I think. It's, it's not, not a as fair much. comparison. No, the, the, I, it's, 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 it's a lazy analogy. I, I think of it more like a Lonnie Anderson maybe but she like, was a hit way well before Burt Reynolds uh you know got That's in touch true. With her. Okay. What what would be like a better comparison? Um It would have to be like um, Oh, what about Julie, like Phil Julie, Hartman? Phil Hartman. Bryn Hartman. Well, what about Julie Chen? Who was she before she married oh. Les Moonves? I don't know. I think she did local stuff, like local okay. news. She was a local Okay. Kimora Lee Simmons. Oh, that's true. Right? I mean, if you want to talk wives that did fuck all and then decided, you know, Linda, Linda McCartney, Linda, Linda McCartney was nobody, but she was married to a very, she was, she, her dad was a uh, part of Kodak. He owned Kodak. So wow. she, she was a photographer. So she didn't, it's not like she didn't have money. Um, and, and, uh, Yoko was an artist at the time, like an avant-garde artist who would have in certain circles had some kind of notoriety for sure, but not the mainstream, not, you know, everything we know about her now. And then of course she put herself out there. They posed nude for, you know, like at the album what do, cover. What do you think about Beth being compared to like a Coco Austin, like Ice T's wife? Um, yeah, sure. Coco was right? a fucking bimbo. She still is a bimbo, but she's mm -hmm. now Ice T's wife. So yeah, that's a perfect comparison. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, she's a rich broad taking someone's job is what she's doing. All I right. mean, come on. And it's boring. It's uh, boring. We got it. We, got, right, you, we got your opinion, Orgy. We got your two cents. Thanks, as always, for calling in. Your call is welcome here anytime. Mike in Atlantic City, you're on the wrap-up show. Hey, Mike. Yeah, consider that last guy's source. Where did he say he's from? West Virginia? I mean, come on. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I want to talk about Beth's very provocative lowball offer and a uh, very straightforward of a million dollars to have her pussy licked. I, I, Mike, and, I'm going to tell you something. What? And, and I, our, during the interview, someone asked, like, how much would you, uh, like, if I donated a million dollars to your cat's cat fund, would you have get someone to lick your pussy? And she said yes. Well... I mean, so you are. A whore. <laughs> What's the medicine for herpes? <laughs> How does it taste? I hold on, hold Mike, hold on a second, Mike. Go ahead, Gary. I walked in during the break, and I said the same exact thing to. I go, Beth. I got to tell you. I go, you lowball that number. I go, there might be somebody out there with a million dollars. And she goes, oh, my God, what are you going to do if the Nortra animally calls me today? I think we have a million dollars. That'd be so oh funny. God. We got three million dollar donations today. <laughs> no one's paying a million to lick that fucking coos. But even how crazy is this? Is like this is the beginning of her inter, you know, intertwining the brands of this book in these in this charity with the Nortra animally. And she says, yes. Just something like this. Do you know how do you know how bad this comes off? Of that course. I said yes to having my pussy licked on air for a million for this animal charity that was basically unknown until I put a name on it. Oh my she, god. She's probably sat on some faces for a lot less. I wonder how they picked this obscure charity. Like what, that's the, interesting that, to me. Like, why which, did they find and latch on to North Shore Animal League? That one's a curious one because, um, I mean, all the big like Fifteen Foundation was Robin's creation, so that doesn't count. The ones that get to Robin, though, like the Sylvia's Kitchen through Fifteen right. Foundation, all these little things. I I suppose if they're local, I I think it's just a matter of somebody with you know uh, like a a swath of business cards for these charities meeting Robin. Somewhere well, at some function, handing the out Robin these cards. Thing, the you know Robin I mean? thing is different because we could see, especially from the financials and all the work that was put towards it and the right. advertisement and everything else, like we could see exactly what that was, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm interested in how did they pluck this essentially obscure charity, the North Shore mm -hmm. Animal League, and decide 
that's going to be the one. Because it's not like PETA. It's not like one of these well-known celebrity endorsed charities that every right. celebrity endorses, whether it be cancer and Roswell or, you know. Well, I, well, well North Shore Animal, North Shore Animal Eve was a Hamptons based charity, wasn't it? Yeah. That's that that's exactly it. Like that's literally what charity is there in this location that's not too far from home, pet related, and that was it. It was like dummy proof. They went into it's like going into the phone book and you picked A because it was at the top of the list of the yellow pages. Yeah. I guess I mean, pet, it's just... pet pet charity. And then you go like I don't know where you <laughs> maybe but it, to me it just looks pages. like once they took it over, it's almost like You know how like political parties like the DNC, like they're running low on cash. So then whoever is the most rich political person who's in the Democratic Party, like Hillary, I'm taking over the DNC essentially because they're running low on funds. I feel like Beth looked at and Howard looked at what which charity is hurting the most that we can can, make our own. Which one can we own? Yes. Yes. Well, I'd say it was that. And then I think, well, whatever it happens, I I believe Buck Buckwald would be the one to say, well, make your own, make your own. And like if if this 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 one isn't cutting it, make your own, make a second one. That's Bianca's furry friends, and now Bianca is nothing. Like that's that's the stupid thing about a charity. Name recognition is everything. When Bianca dies, why does the name have to change to Beth's furry friends? And your your take was they're just trying to escape bad bad press on Charity Navigator, um, all the bad reviews. The minute you change the name, all of a sudden the tax things go shifted, and oops, we got to start from scratch. Well, I think they changed it to Beth's Furry Friends because they were in the middle of a huge construction project when it was Bianca's Furry Friends. Yep. And then they had a bunch of celebrities come to the opening of this location that took years and years, over a decade to build. It was supposed to cost X amount, but it cost like five times X. And every time you get an update on it, it's like nothing's being done. But then once it was finally done... All of a sudden, amidst this, they changed it to Beth's Furry Friends. So I think there was some real fuckery going on when it had to do with taxes and it had to do with um, financials, admitting what was on the books. And why were these construction projects taking so long with all the money that was coming in? Yep. Uh, guys, we're going to wrap that up right now. We're going to continue with the next part of this at another time. We hope you've enjoyed it, and um, we'll see you guys again soon on the, the next episode. Have a good one. Yeah, well, midgets get mad, and I've seen this like in show business. Uh, there was a midget in Dirty Work, and uh, the call sheet just said, uh, like, Norm MacDonald, Artie Lang, and it just said midget. Oh, and, oh. Like, The fucking midget went ballistic and called his agent, and his agent was a midget. But this broad is... <laughs> No, really? <laughs> yeah, because I guess they, they take care of each other and start screaming at the uh, how dare you. Those he, midgets always stick together. He's got a name uh, like uh, <laughs> like Norm and Artie, blah, blah, blah. And the next day. Maybe he's right. Well, he's 100% right. Right, right. But midget. the next, the, it just said midget, like like chair, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. they kept saying, and the black. You know, well, they really right. well that's some, not right. Some hilarious kid, though, in the in the office, and as wrong as this is, it was so funny. The next day, the, the midget's name was Paul. Forget his last name. But the next day, it said Paul the Midget. <laughs> <laughs> no, they still did that. It said oh. Paul the Midget. Oh. <laughs> 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 Who's writing? Well, they want to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> Who is writing? <laughs> 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 <laughs>